Hi everyone, my name is David. First I want to apologize for my shitty English. I'm from France, I'm gonna do uh, my best to speak slowly and enunciate. <laughs> Hi mom. All right, uh, I am the creator of Babylon.js. I am working for Microsoft on Babylon.js. Um, and yes, we are supporting WebXR as it's moving, so. <laughs> You can try it today against the current implementation of the current spec. And obviously, as soon as it's going to be stable, we will implement it in the snap of a finger. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to share with you uh, my experience, actually, regarding uh, WebGL and how we moved to, actually, how we supported uh, WebGPU, kind of. So first uh, presentation. Babylon.js is a open source free 3D engine that uh, you can use. It's here to help you uh, use a low level API. Like we mentioned WebXR, even though WebXR is pretty simple to deal with, you still need to render 3D on top of that and that could be a, uh, um, a complicated task. So we are here for help you on that, on WebGL, WebGPU, WebXR, you name it, Web Audio. Uh, it's a full feature engine. Uh, we support um, kind of what you should need for games, uh, including physics, VR. I guess things, stuff like that. Uh, it's backward compatible. We really, I hate when I have to rewrite something uh, when I use a new version of a API, so I put that into the foundation of Babylon.js. Babylon.js is backward compatible. So it's complicated from the engine standpoint, but from your standpoint, it's gonna work everywhere. Anyway, um, we provide tool set that I'm gonna get back on. Uh, we have a playground where uh, you can just learn by doing. That's me, I write documentation. It's a pain in the heck. I know you don't read documentation, so we have a tools for that. We call it the playground where you can learn without reading documentation. We are also responsible at Microsoft for uh, exporters. So in 3ds Max, um, Maya, Blender, and Unity 3D, we created a GLTF exporter. GLTF is what we try to um, uh, consider as the de facto standard for 3D, for file formats. So um, it's an open source standard for 3D file format. It's pretty complicated. It was pretty complicated before that. Now, GLTF is kind of the language we all speak. So we try to support that as well. We have a pretty, uh, I am proud of the community above everything else. Uh, it's a pretty active community, forum.babylongs.com. If you want to learn of, or ask any question, just go to the forum. We really have good people there. Uh, it's used across the web. We use it a lot at Microsoft. It's also used by Adobe, Sony, whatever. Uh, Minecraft. If you go to minecraft.com, there is a new version of Minecraft, which is on the web. And it's using Babylon.js for that. All right, let's go back to the topic. WebGL and WebGL2. Um, who is already familiar with WebGL? Oh, I'm surprised. OK. Who already used WebGL? Oh, the same, wow. <laughs> and you're still alive, incredible. Um, <laughs> so WebGL is um, it's kind of a port of OpenGL ES2 and 3 uh, to the web. Um, uh, and it's a kind of interesting uh, spec and a kind of interesting API. It's a, a stateful uh, API, meaning that you have a gigantic state, a state that you change value on, okay? So for instance, you want to render a triangle on the screen. Before rendering the triangle on the screen, you have to set up the entire state to make sure you can render your triangle. And setting the entire state, meaning, okay, I want to set the clear color, I want to set which shader, so which language I'm gonna use uh, to render on the screen and stuff like that. And if you want to render two objects, you're gonna set up the state for the first one, render the first one, set up the state for the second one, and render the second one, okay? Um, state changes are a problematic stuff in uh, this uh, story because we are living in a JavaScript world and WebGL will communicate back to the native API. And so every time you change the state, there is a communication between JavaScript and the native API. And that is expensive, okay? And uh, remember, we are dealing with um, 3D meaning we want to render at least at 60 frames per second, so we need to remove all the friction we can find. So, let me show you something. That's the playground. Playground.babylongs.com or babylongs.com playground.com. And it's a place where you can just enter code here. Uh, we give you um, IntelliSense, so you can type, and it does not work, obviously. Oh, wonderful. Sometimes it works. Um, it's where you can type your code, and when you hit the run button here, you're gonna render the scene directly here. So that's the PBR shader of Babylon.js. 
Uh, it's a GLTF file. Let me show you. Here, we just load a GLTF file from a file server, and that's it. That's the amount of code you have to deal with if you want to uh, create a scene. BabylonJS will help you by creating the default camera and light if you don't provide one, and also the same thing for the default environment. Okay, I'm gonna use a browser extension named Spector.js. Spector.js here will help me show you under the hood. So what's happening inside this rendering? I don't know if I click or not. Let's say I did it. So this tool is a debugger that we brought to help us actually uh, debug WebGL. Um, that's a shame, but browsers do not provide a um, uh, WebGL debugger. They give it, they give you WebGL and deal with that. So that's the final outcome, okay? And that's the story, not of my cake this time, but of my uh, rendering. We have actually here a first call. Would I, I click twice? <laughs> Here we have a first call to clear. So here what you see is all the WebGL order, all the WebGL commands that we are sending down the WebGL path, okay? So to render the image that you saw before, this little guy here, when I'm, uh, that I can move at 60 frames per second, actually, we first clear the screen. And then we set up a lot of state, because remember, WebGL is a state machine. So I have to set up a lot of stuff and send a command. So I am setting my viewport. I ask him, okay, please use that specific shader and then bind that specific memory array, which is a geometry, and then uh, set that matrix, matrix and then bind another um, buffer, which is the list of faces, and then set that texture, that texture, that texture, that texture, okay? And boom, first command, render 16,000-ish triangles. Okay, wow. And so you see the headset. Okay, and then we move to the next one. Okay, it's please change the buffer you want to render. Now I render a new object. Babylon.js is here to help you optimize. So we, we check for you that you are not uh, sending unwanted uh, WebGL commands. Okay, so between two orders in blue here, there is just a minimum amount of changes that we have uh, to do to let you render what you want. So second order here, that's the, the the glasses and blah and blah and blah and blah and blah and blah and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Few command later, then that's the final one. Okay. And every time, actually, every time there is a blue command, we ask the engine, the GPU, to do something. And WebGL was here to translate between us in JavaScript into something that the WebGL engine will understand. I am running on Windows 10 here, so the WebGL in Chrome here, on uh, Edge Home, sorry, it's, Edge Home, it's the same thing, but yeah. We call it Edge. Uh, in Edge here, we'll execute DirectX code ultimately, okay? And WebGL will do that translation for me. If you run exactly the same page on, uh, let's say, a MacBook using Safari, it will translate first into, I guess, still OpenGL and soon <coughs> into Metal, okay? And so here you see that among other commands, we also send this beast, which is the shader code, the code that's gonna be executed by the shader, by the GPU, okay? So the GPU does not speak C++ or JavaScript or whatever. It speaks a specific language named GLSL, okay? And that's GLSL here. We explain, okay, what should you do to render the pixel, okay? And that could be pretty complicated here, and that's what you have to do if you want to use WebGL. You have to do all of that. Send all the commands, set up the states, and then write the shaders to explain how to render every single uh, pixel. So that's why uh, engines like uh, Sumerian or Babylon.js are required because most of the time you don't have all the knowledge and all the time to do that. The main problem that I wanted to underline here with WebGL, even though it works pretty well, I see here I can render PBR physically based rendering with almost uh, no, no problem. See, I have a pretty damn number of uh, textures that are all rendered here. The problem is that if I want to go further than that, I am kind of limited. First, I am limited because there is no real support for threading. I am forced to work on one single thread here. And secondly, I have to deal with this state, okay? I can't prepare the state. I have to update them every time I want to change an object, okay? And furthermore, WebGL is a kind of OpenGL yes for the web, and that does not work very well with DirectX 12, Vulkan, or Metal, all the new APIs, okay? 
So knowing all of that, smart people decided that, yes, oh, and by the way, good, the pretty powerful stuff for WebGL, it works kind of almost everywhere. I barely found a device where it does not work. There are various support of, uh, level of support, obviously, but most of the time it works perfectly well. Even on a feature phone that it's like probably 20 bucks, it still works. All right, then came WebGPU. So the question was, uh, what do we want to solve with WebGPU? We want to solve the fact that we don't want a stateful machine. We want a stateless machine. The big difference is here. The big difference is that with a stateless machine, I can prepare my commands, store them, and say, boom, render that. And that is a big bunch of stuff that the system will use, render, move to the next one, render. I don't have to change a singleton of information. I have as much as I want. You can think as WebGPU like, Web like a mini WebGL engine, in the sense that we're going to capture the states and then use them as, a, as we wish, okay? First, and second point really important is that we are really closer to the metal. Exactly the same story as what Anel mentioned with uh, WebXR. WebXR was uh, meant to help uh, connect with a various set of SDKs, and here we have the same story. We need to be closer to DirectX 12 in the same sense that we need to be closer to Vulkan and Metal, and so we need a API which is adapt to this kind of um, new APIs. It's a um, evolving standard. We are far from being complete on web GPU. There is no way today, actually, there is a tiny uh, way to do it. If you have worked on a Mac using Canary, there is a flag, that's like, yeah, you really want to test it, uh, that, uh, that you can turn on, and you're going to have a pretty uh, an embryo of uh, what could be G web GPU, because it changes every day. Uh, we are working with the Google team on this specific uh, story. So they implement stuff. We implement that in Babylon.js, we do some tests, oh no, it's faster, it's slower, etc. The main problem we face here is that we want to be faster while executing JavaScript code. And so we need to shape the WebGPU API so that there are as less as possible number of interaction between the JavaScript layer and the WebGPU layer. And that's what we are working on right now. Anyway, if you want to have a sense of what it could be, don't do that, actually, I prepared it already. Yeah, sure. That's a cool video. So on the left, WebGL, on the right, WebGPU, and we are just increasing the number of meshes. By increasing the number of meshes, we increase the number of state changes. And you can see that at some point, WebGL is just gonna die. It's 12 frames per second. So 80 milliseconds per frame, because we change so many times. Sorry. And when we are on WebGPU, it's running on a standard uh, Mac laptop, nothing very specific, using the discrete, GP, the discrete GPU, not even an NVIDIA or whatever, it's check, like Intel GPU. The same scene, the same amount of meshes works far better because of the fact that there is no more state. What does that mean from an implement, implementation standpoint? I give you a tiny example, sorry, maybe not easy to follow, but let me try. This is what we do when we work with WebGPU so far. It can change like overnight, but just to give you a sense of what we are working on right now. On WebGL, we have one object, the device context, and we say, hey, device context, set that state, set that state, set that state, render, set that state, set that state, render, okay? With WebGPU, it's far more powerful because we create context and we own that context. So I create a context, I set value on that context, that's my input, that my index buffer, that's the information I want to set on that context, and I'm gonna save that context, and I can reuse it. So as soon as my contexts are ready, rendering the example that we have here will cost nothing because I just say render context, render context, render context, render context. I have like one context per meshes, for instance, and I just say render, 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 render. There is no more state changes because there is no more state. Actually, there are states, but I own them. So I'm, I hopefully I see people nodding, so I am kind of clear. <laughs> and when I am excited, I speak faster than when I am not. And so I start to not enunciate, <laughs> but I hope you get my point. And so that's pretty much it. Um, you 
can try it today. You, sorry, it's possible to try it today. You need to have a Mac with the very version of Canary of uh, Chrome that uh, with Canary. Um, we have a page on our documentation. You just should go to uh, doc.babylonjs.com, search for the web. You can search for WebXR, and you see what uh, what works for so far. And we can search for WebGPU. And so here we have WebGPU and. And I'm not on screen for some reason. What? Magic? No. <laughs> the man that whispers to cables. Who whispers to cables. So here you have the um, what we did so far, what are the experiments, and you have a live example uh, here. But if I click it, because I am on Windows, Windows did not implement yet uh, the expected stuff. Uh, so I am simulating. I have got a wonderful alert. Like uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Um, that's it. So if you have any question, I'm fine to uh, take question if you have. If I can answer. Any question? I was crystal clear. Or oh, it's the opposite, like uh, you, uh, I don't know what you said. <laughs> yes? Uh, you just said it doesn't work well on Windows. Does it work on Linux? No, no. It does not work on both because it's not implemented. It's not that it does not work well, it does not work at all. Uh, it's an implementation question. Because it's so moving sense so far, uh, the Google team decided to pick one. Uh, uh, hardware that they are pretty uh, at ease with, which is the, like everyone else but me, uh, a MacBook. Uh, so they decided to just implement it on MacBook. Uh, my, uh, Microsoft has a task, if you go to the WebGPU GitHub um, list, there is a task for Microsoft to also implement Dawn, which is the new of the new engine in Google that's going to support WebGPU. We will implement it at some point. But the, the spec is moving so fast, and we are at the very beginning. There are expectations, and I know that in standard, expectations are like. Uh, Overrated. We have expectation to um, uh, have a uh, uh, testable version everywhere by end of this year, probably around November. The thing is that with Babylon GS, you just develop your Babylon GS team, and we will uh, uh, see and we will take care of switching first in WebGPU if it's supported, and then we go back to WebGPU, WebGL2, and if not supported, then WebGL1. That's the interest of having a intermediate layer that's going to take care of the um, uh, gory details. So it's pretty fun to do. You have to like uh, gory details. Yep. How much time does it take you to develop uh, such backwards compatibility first on the API and then secondly also on GPU, WebGPU, WebGL2, and WebGL1? Like, isn't that so much time consuming? It's a lot of time, yeah. <laughs> it's if, uh, I started Babylon GS as a pet project. Uh, before it was uh, then used by Microsoft uh, uh, six years ago. Uh, and the goal was to be backward compatible since the very beginning because I, I went down the path of rewriting everything every week, like a new version, you know that in JavaScript, a new version of everything shipped almost every day, right? So I thought React was a stuff, and then a week later it's, it's like, uh, no, yeah, you are so old, man, you're doing React, seriously. <laughs> You should do view now. Like it's all, the, all over the place. So I decided, okay, for 3D, WebGL is here to stay, but we know that there's going to be something else, uh, WebGL 2 and whatever. So we decided to think the architecture in a way that we have a layer that is uh, exactly like WebXR in a sense. We, we try to be uh, as flexible as possible to be future proof. And sometimes it doesn't work. And if you open BabylonJS code, there are pieces where we, we call that the caves. Like you should not go there. <laughs> they are here for a reason, and we have a big, large uh, uh, comments like, please don't change that code. It's here, and we know it's uh, ugly, you know, it's, the, it's sad, but we have to keep it because of backward compatibility. And that's why enterprise ch choose to use BabylonJS because they know they're going to invest on it. And so a year from now, when they move to the new version of BabylonJS, they won't have to redo everything because the API changed. They are good and bad about this uh, philosophy. The good is that users are pretty happy with that. The bad is that we developers sometimes, we have to deal with what we did. Like, uh, I don't speak English very well, so the very first version of BabylonJS has some interesting uh, namings. <laughs> like, properties that look like people, uh, at least once a month, I have someone doing a PR to fix my uh, typos. Like, I have a property named Moose Sensibility. 
because in French, sensibility, it's sensitivity, I guess that's the right wording, and so I use sensibility, which sounds cool to me, and it's completely wrong. So the way you decide how, you moves, how your mouse moves, uh, like uh, is it smooth or not smooth, it's a pretty interesting property name. <laughs> So the documentation state that, yeah, the author is completely dumb, but we have to keep it because now people use it. No more questions? Perfect. Thank you very much.